they're doing the math. Their day begins at 3.30 and ends at like almost 8. Yeah, uh, they typically get up around 3.30. The first time that they're in the chapel is at 4 o'clock for what we call vigils. That lasts about an hour back in the chapel at 5.45. So they'll actually be in the chapel eight times during the course of the day. And that's every single day? Every single day, yeah. Seem to leave a lot of time for sleeping. Some of the prayer sessions are very short. We call those the little hours. That's just a reminder of, oh yeah, that's why we're here. Quoted by the uh, Los Angeles Times as saying, monks don't make IPAs. Not in the 1200 year tradition of monastic brewing, especially American IPAs. My background is in uh, engineering and chemistry. I eventually ended up in Portland, Oregon, um, 30, no, almost 40 years ago, just of course as the craft industry was really starting to take off there. So got to be in sort of the Mecca, the epicenter of yeah, the craft group. And given a, a monastic name, which happens to be Brother Barnabas. What is the, uh, there's a pretty, uh, I know a little bit about kind of the uh, monastic history of brewing, but specifically, what is the importance of Benedictine monastic brewing to, I guess, modern brewing? St. Benedict lived at the beginning of the 6th century. He was the son of a um, mid-level um, Roman bureaucrat. When he was sent to Rome um, for schooling, he was horrified at what he saw. So he went off by himself and uh, became a hermit. He wrote a rule for how to live in a monastery, how to run a monastery, called the Rule of St. Benedict. A very small, a very small book that today still governs the life of Benedictines, Cistercians, Trappists. When you come to a Benedictine monastery, you are guaranteed three things. First, you are guaranteed a place to sleep out of the elements. Second, you are guaranteed safety. And obviously in the Dark Ages, Middle Ages, um, <laughs> and on, that was a big deal. And the third thing you were guaranteed was sustenance. Sustenance came in the form of uh, food and drink. It's now um, the middle of the 6th century, would you have consumed the water? The process, of course, of making beer, as we were doing in there, involves boiling the beer for 90 minutes. To some degree, um, they, in parallel with um, individual communities, really started to think about going beyond brewing beer just for consumption in our own home. You know, they started to think about it as a commercial activity because they had to feed all their guests, okay? And that tradition still exists today. The rule of Benedict also tells us that monasteries have to earn their own way. They have to make their own living. They can't just go out and beg. Because to Benedictines, work is a form of prayer. And prayer takes work. Right? So when we're brewing, um, to us, it's just another form of prayer. In the early 60s, a monk of a monastery in um, western New York, Father Elred, he said, oh, you know, I, I want a more contemplative life. And so he was allowed to start looking all over the west. When they bought the ranch here, the the monks that he brought with them, they literally were living in tents down by the river. All right. The monastery, of course, has grown over the years and now has about 50 monks from 14 different countries. I think about five different continents. Enter stage left, Brad Kraus, um, who's a, probably one of the fathers of New Mexico craft brewing. Brad's been brewing probably for 40 years. Um, he started his professional career in Texas, working for Pierre Sellis at what is Hoogarten, um, 
So Brad is also highly uh, sought after as a professional judge. Um, so he came forward and said, great, you know, we, we could start to make beers in that European monastic tradition. So the first beer he developed was the Monk's Ale, which is the Potter's Beer. It's a very nice session beer, very approachable. In they go. The um, hops that are grown here at the monastery are Neomexicanus. Uh, as you saw, you drove past the hop yard. It'll be another couple of weeks before you pop out of the ground. But once they pop out of the ground, they grow very, very quickly. In late June and July, they go away grow. Eight inches to a foot a day until they top out of the top of the trellis, and our trellises are 18 feet. The goal is to have the hop plants hit the top of the trellis basically the week after the summer solstice, because that then gives you the best um, the best branching. Um, and we'll give you essentially the best year. There's a wonderful gentleman that lives in Embudo, New Mexico, and his name is Todd Bates, and he's a plant geneticist. And normally he works on cash crops, so he's gonna work on uh, tomatoes and peppers and things that are grown in this region. But he's also a home brewer, he's also a very keen hiker. He would see these wild hops from time to time. He sent them to the USDA hop laboratory up in Corvallis, Oregon at Oregon State University. And so they did the genetics on them and said, oh, what you have here is Neo-Mexicanus hops. Then started crossing them to create varieties and create what he thought would be good um, beer producing hops. And he, out of that, produced about seven varieties. We have six of them. And then the other one he held on to. They have a lot of characteristics of the noble hops. We use them primarily, of course, as aroma hops. And you can purchase these online for, um, if you're a home one, one, Yeah, when they're available, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, the site is www.holyhops.com. H-O-L-Y-H-O-P-S. I'm sorry, it's .biz. Even if you wanted to, you can imagine when there's snow on that road or when it's raining. Oh, yeah. Because when it rains, that road turns to pure adobe mud. The tap room right now, the Monk's Corner in downtown Albuquerque right now, we have the triple reserve on. So I brewed that batch November, December with the harvest from 2016. I read about that one that's got some. It won an award not too long ago, the triple reserve. Yeah, it, we had sent it up to uh, Denver. The, the monks are very um, humble, and uh, I'm not supposed to enter any of our beers uh, in the contest, <laughs> no. but I occasionally just say, ah, oh, what the heck, and I'll hold my hand out and get it slapped. Um, so for two years in a row, I sent the hops up to the Denver International Beer Competition. And the first year, I think we won a, we won a bronze. The next year, we won, won a silver, and then the monks found out, and I got my wrist slapped. <laughs> so that shut that down. Do the monks here drink beer? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> are there are there rules guiding yes, that all right. over well, consumption? Yeah. Here. My my, my but, little bit of reading about monastic drinking habits hundreds of years ago right. is that they could consume right. quite a bit. Yes. The Fourth of July is coming up. Yep. You know, we'll have a great party here. And, We'll uh, drink some great uh, New Mexico wines and uh, consume some great New Mexico beers, including Monk Sales. <laughs> <laughs> um, it gets reasonably hot in New Mexico in the summer, and the thought of drinking, let's say, a stout in the middle of the summer, where you feel like you've just consumed a bowling ball, and so we worked very hard to develop a variation on a summer British porter that we call Monk's Dark that is now becoming incredibly powerful. It may, in fact, this year or next year, outsell the Monk's Ale, which is the flagship. Wow. It's a beer that we've brewed specifically for the southwestern United States, so you can consume it in the winter or in the middle of the summer, um, and it's a wonderful, wonderful beer. We're working on developing now another standard of 
of the Agron Cru. This spring we produce the grapefruit wit. Later in the summer, um, I've got two beers in my back pocket, either a blood orange or a tart cherry, one of those two. So I've finished working on those uh, over the winter and they're sort of ready to go. It's just a question of, okay, when do we make a batch and put it out there? Stand-up comedy inside. I don't want to go in. Because they're going to make fun of Lauren. Okay. What are you doing? <laughs> um, I'll go off the record here right now, okay? Sure. Um, back on the record. Uh, we'll go off the record again, okay? Mm -hmm.